that's um, always sort of a difficult thing for somebody who, like myself, studied the Middle Ages because things are never as simple as they look. I know that Pope John II, Pope John Paul II, said that Francis was the patron saint of ecology, and that's fine. And I like that because he loved animals, he loved all creatures of God. But the reason that the current Pope, Francis, took that name was because he wanted to be mindful of the poor. That's what he specifically said. And if there was one thing that Francis loved more than all the creatures of God, it was poverty. So you can see that even though 800 years separate us from this fellow, he's still a challenge if we try to use him as we do with the saints as an example of what our life could be or should be. As we look at that, it's a challenge. <coughs> He was born rich, I don't know if you knew that. His father was a merchant, made a lot of money, and like the kids of oftentimes affluent parents, he kind of didn't work, he frittered away a lot of things to the point where he got on his father's nerves. And he went to church and he had a vision that he was supposed to rebuild this particular church. Later on he would change his understanding of that, that he was supposed to rebuild the whole church. But as he's giving money to this church for repairing altars and so forth, his father's telling him, don't waste your money. And finally, he gets so mad at his father that he says, you know, I have to do my own thing. And his father said, what fathers say today, you only live under my roof, everything you got, you know, have you heard this speech? <laughs> everything you've got is mine, even the clothes on your back. And Francis, being a typical young man with passion, stands outside, supposedly, actually this is depicted oftentimes in paintings, he's standing outside his father's house on the street, he says, okay, and starts to strip off everything, including his underwear. <laughs> and supposedly, the bishop was there who puts his cloak around him, symbolizing that, okay, come into the church. And from that point on, he had very little to do with his father or his family. He sought out the poorest of the poor, and even lepers is where he went. Because what he heard in the gospel was Jesus calling out to those who were poor to be lifted up in spirit. He heard that God was tearing down and ignoring the things that man had built up, and instead he saw things, Francis did, things as barriers to the spirit, to a true life in Christ. So when we come, I guess we have to take the whole Francis. We have to take the whole Francis. And Francis, as he was, was focused on a life that he thought emulated Christ. And if Christ did not have a place to lay his head and told people to live from day to day on the goodness of others, then Francis decided he was going to beg for his living. And the followers who joined him were doing that. Now that was upsetting even in that day. Can you imagine that group today? Particularly they started to gain followers. That's kind of a threat. So when, the, when finally, he gets the authorization from the church. It is to do it our way. You can live this life, but you're also within the church and living it underneath. That's important to understand. The church from the beginning recognized the good things Francis did, but they saw the threat of what could be. In fact, just a few years before that, there was a similar movement in uh, to the east of where Francis grew up, and they were put down by a crusade against them as heretics. So when the Pope says, okay, I will authorize this, let's see your rule. And the rule
rule is simple. Follow the gospel, which means you don't have anything of your own. Call everything that you have a gift from God. Consider all creatures, all things in creation, to be your brother. No one is higher than anyone else in Francis's understanding. But humility, which he saw as Christ preaching, humility is what makes us brothers and sisters with one another. That's why he even extends it to a poem where he calls Brother Sun and Sister Moon. But most people don't read down where he also calls Death, Sister Death, who comes and takes us away and gives us rest. That's a very radical vision of things. It not only sends the animals and other people, but it means that all things in his life would be focused on whether that reflected Christ or deflected him from Christ. Now, they talked about him, I've read it several times, that his life was iconic. That's one of those words you hear, you hear about. Now, watch this week. See how many times icon or iconic pop up in your reading in the newspaper and wherever else you might hear it. It's kind of an overused word. And if icon is that thing that's been reduced on your computer screen, you know, that little symbol, if you click on it, it gets you where you want, or it opens a program or something, that's too small to encompass the vision of Francis. The icon there reduces him in what he's saying. Because if we read or hear what he preached, and that's what he did throughout the rest of his life, was preach, 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 even though he's a lay person. Preach the gospel, which is nothing but the good news of God's love and nothing that will separate us from God's love, so long as we follow Christ. That's the essence of his preaching and his teaching. If we go to that as our icon, and then I like the word, the way the Orthodox use that term. You've seen Eastern or icons, right? They're considered windows of the Spirit into heaven. People don't just look at them or click on them, they become absorbed into the spiritual presence that they bring. If we see it that way, then Francis can be an icon. Because Francis would always point past himself to God. Past himself, especially to Christ. And I'm glad that the reading that was assigned for this day included Paul's letter where he says, Let nobody bother me. Because nothing matters except Christ crucified for me. Because that makes me a new creation. In the death of Christ, he saw the death of his own old self, Paul did. And that's the teaching that was incorporated by Francis. Death to the old, rich, spoiled, mind filled with things and frivolous stuff. And the new life that replaces it is radically different. I think you and I would find if we tried to live as Francis did, it would upset absolutely everything. Our relationships, our homes, all the things that give us a sense of well-being. But he's saying that that sense is transitory. What lasts is the understanding of ourselves as being in Christ. And then Paul says, let nobody bother me because I bear the marks of Christ. Nobody knows quite what that line means. But for Francis, it was obviously something that was very real. On a certain date while he was praying in the middle of a 40-day fast, by the way, people always want the visions in that. Read any of those folks who had those visions, and it comes after years of fasting or dedication, and then something opens up in their mind or spirit. I guess I haven't had the visions because I haven't made my adequate preparation for it. But after 40 days of fasting, 
he sees an angel who brings the image of Christ and he bears them on his arms and his side and his feet. And supposedly the people who were with him saw that when he died. They saw those marks on him. And they gave him pain, but he covered them up. His final, final completion of his journey, as he was concerned, was to be so much one with Christ, not in what he did only in outward course, but inwardly to be transformed, so that Christ marked him literally as his own. Did that really happen that way? Nobody can tell you hundred years later. It was supposedly witnessed. But the importance of that story is the identity to Christ. And if, if Francis were here to preach today, he would not preach about himself. He would preach about the transformation that is possible when we leave the things of this world go. As, as it was said in the Sermon on the let things go and be free from all that to really be transformed by Christ. What would the world look like if we did not compete for ownership or possession? It could be oil, it could be power, it could be whatever. If the things that now own us, that we think we own, were let go, even to a degree, then it'd be easier to see my sister and my brother in all faces. Whether they looked like me or dwelt in the same country or came from the same stock or prayed in the same way or believed in the same way. If all people were truly seen through the eyes of God as Francis tried to see them and preach that, if all people were really one, there would be no need for most of the things that plague and afflict us. If we were free through Christ to be all that God has called us to be, that the burdens would be lifted from our shoulders and given the commission to love. That's what Francis tried to live. That's what we honor in him but ultimately is what Christ himself, Francis would be the first to say this, Christ himself exemplified. Christ among us was what our brother Francis tried to bring. So when we honor him today, it is a good thing to bring our pets and remember the creation as a whole. It is a good thing to see ourselves through the eyes of God as Francis tried to understand himself and his world. It is a good thing for us to take seriously the message of the gospel that all those things that we normally call our own and that define us finally can be let go if we seek our meaning and understanding, our identity, our life. Francis would preach that above all things. And in that spirit, then, we go forth from here to enjoy God's work.